I have a question, Stuart. Yes. Is it possible to notice thoughts arising during the meditation while still maintaining the attention in the hara, or is the fact that one notices thought, um, does that mean that the attention is not there anymore? Well, you know, uh, you know, the first part of this is that there'll always be thoughts rising. Um, you know, but focusing in the hara enables us not to attach ourselves to them and to let them just disappear. They will come and they will go. But there will always be thoughts. And in many ways, we need that, you know, 5% of, you know, because it's a reminder that we need to go a little bit deeper inside ourselves. We need to get more focused. So those thoughts will arise during the meditation class. What happens is you get so conditioned, you know, to keeping your attention in the hara, you know, right at the core of your being, you know, that you don't attach yourself to the thoughts. They're like birds singing in the trees, you know, and you don't really, you know, uh, get involved with them. And this is a point of growth that takes place in anyone that practices this kind of meditation. It takes time, it takes conditioning, it takes a lot of work on oneself. And it really is the acceptance of the fact that none of us are perfect. You understand there's always gonna be some kind of imperfection inside us. And one of the imperfections is, you know, there'll always be thoughts, but, having the strength to not attach and get swept away in them and, and all the tension and the conflict in thought, that is really the key to the meditation. And then, as I said before, they're like birds singing in the trees, like a car driving past. You don't get involved. And you have the capacity to stay centered and keep drawing down spiritual energy, which continues to make you stronger inside and more capable of not being involved in the conflict and polarity of thought. So yes, there, there, there will be thoughts. It doesn't mean you're not centered. What it means is, is that, you know, none of us are perfect. <laughs> We're not perfect. And there'll always be that imperfection. I mean, my teacher always used to kid around and say, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a pearl is a product of, uh, you know, irritation in, a, in an oyster, you know, and it's true. You know, a diamond is a product of 50,000 years of pressure on the earth, from the earth. Uh, there will always be that. Now, our job is to transform all of these things into internal pearl, into a diamond, into something that is the highest levels that we can possibly transform tension into. And that is such an integral part of the meditation that it gives you the capacity to do this. And I think to me, it was one of the most amazing thing I ever learned from my teacher, how to do that. Of course, it cleared the path for everything else to take place. So if you have thoughts, you know, don't get all involved with them and just get more centered and they will just fly away, they'll disappear new ones will come and they will disappear. And eventually you have such a grounding inside yourself that you don't identify with any of that conflict and tension that exists in thinking. So yes, uh, that's what happens. Look, I've been doing this a lot longer than anyone here and it still happens to me, thoughts come up, but I don't listen to them. I have a much more important thing to do in myself, and that's to stay grounded so I can really receive that higher creative energy and let it build my life. I hope that's clear, you know, I mean, uh, and uh, it's just part of living. There's always going to be something wrong in life, you know? And we too easily get swept away in all the crap that goes on in this world. And only because we haven't yet conditioned ourselves to, to tap, become detached from it. 
to not allow it to suck our creative energy out of us. And that's thinking and that's all the, you know, stuff that goes on in life. And, you know, for God's sake, you know. But once we build that inner capacity, my God, you know, so much energy is conserved that can be used to tap the source of all creative energy. And then that energy guides our life, not our minds, not our egos, not our, you know, and that's where, that's where the music comes from. For God's sake, my Bach, my, my favorite books. I'm going to where the music comes from. And we can tap that music and it becomes this incredible manifestation of, you know, what life as a sacred thing that we are living in, instead of being a royal pain in the ass. Thank you. That helped. You're welcome. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question, Stuart. Um, my mom went into the hospital today with pneumonia. And so my question is, what or how can I support her healing energetically? Look, if somebody is sick, I mean, you have to love them unconditionally. You understand? You have to, uh, you know, be there for them unconditionally with the deepest amount of love that you can bring to them. And we should do this anyway with people in our lives. And, uh, and you know, nurture them through it. And be conscious of also not catching pneumonia when you're around her, you know, but at the same time, let her understand that you unconditionally love her. You're unconditionally there for her. And not just through the words you say, but through what you do, you know, your actions, how you share that love with your mother, and not only your mother, but with anybody, your children, anyone that's close to you. I mean, look, I've been through so much. I mean, you know, if you read that book I wrote called Leah, you know, I mean, I, I've been through, I don't know, a hundred things like that in my life with people who were very sick and all kinds of stuff. I remember once there was a, a student of mine who had AIDS and he had this thing called Kaposi sarcoma, whatever, I can't remember. And his whole body was covered with scales. And he was just lying in bed, you know, struggling to overcome that. And, and I was sitting there and it was heartbreaking. And I, I finally said to him, look, why don't you just let go? Why don't you just let go? It was one of those compassionate things I ever said to anybody. I said, you know, I said, you're going to come back here as a beautiful baby with everything to live for, you know, and you're going to bring into your next lifetime everything you've learned in this lifetime about spiritual practice. And he looked at me and he started to smile. And he said, thank you. And the next day he left. Instead of spending all that time struggling against something that was impossible to struggle against, just let go. You know, I had that with another student of mine early on when I first moved back to New York. I had a student, uh, her name was Eleanor Olson, and she was, you know, the, she was the curator of Tibetan art at the Newark Museum. And she was also a student of Rudy's when Rudy was alive. And she came to me and started studying with me. And she was a pretty elderly woman. She was probably about 80 years old at the time. And uh, she had a terminal cancer, you know? And she used to come in my gallery at least twice a week and I would do healing work with her. And then the cancer went into remission. It was really a miracle that took place. And she came and said, well, the doctors told me it's in remission. And then one day, about maybe eight months later, a year, she said, Stuart, she came in my gallery and she said, Stuart, I can't do this anymore. I don't have the energy to continue this battle. And she told me that she wanted to leave the world. I started doing Bardo work with her, a whole transitional work where we opened up that whole range of the Bardo and her soul went there and began to prepare itself to 
You know, it's this kind of thing that Tibetans do, you know, and I was, I just learned it, doing it with her, you know? And <clears throat> I'll never forget, you know, I went up to her apartment and she was lying in bed in a fetal position, you know? And it looked, you know, she was just ready to leave. And I sat there and I did a really deep meditation with her. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. She came out of the fetal position. She sat up at the bed and looked me directly in the eye and said, thank you. Went back into the fetal position and it was the last thing she ever said. It's how unconditional love nurtures people in the world when they're ready to leave the world, when they're coming into the world. <laughs> we have to be big enough to do that. You have to be big enough to do this with your mother. Thank God there are, you know, medicines for pneumonia and they can take care of that. Yeah, she lives in Israel and she said she definitely wants to live and be here. I already asked her, what are you doing? Go, what's going on? So yeah. Um, I love that what you said about unconditional love that resonates very deeply. Of course, she's your mother, you know. I mean, look, you can fight with your boyfriend, but I love your mother unconditionally. You, know? you have no choice. <laughs> I mean, the same thing happened with my mother. She got cancer and wanted, you know, asked me if I could do healing work with her, and I started doing it. The thing went into remission and then she's, you know, I mean, it was, and then, you know, then she, you know, about two, three, four years later, she got very sick and she passed on, but it was unconditional love taking care of her, you know, and I'll never forget even my student, she came to live in my ashram, you know, my loft uh, on 4th Avenue and 10th Street and people were, you know, making juices for her, helping her. And it was so, it was kind of a beautiful thing to see. And then one day she told me the same thing that Eleanor said, I can't do this anymore, Steve. it's too much. And then she told me she wanted to leave. So I had to reverse the whole thing again and work with her in a different way, preparing her, loving her to leave the world. I mean, I have, I mean, a million stories of this kind, you know, that I've been through in my life with people. And I learned a lot about unconditional love. And it's the kind of thing I even bring to this meditation here. Uncon I don't care if I like you, I don't like you, <laughs> if I want to be friends with you or not, it doesn't matter to me. And what matters to me is that I'm here to serve God and transmit spiritual energy to everybody who comes. And my personal likes and dislikes have nothing to do with this class, you know? Everybody is equal. And everybody deserves the, to have the opportunity to grow and to have a spiritual life and to get free of all problems and tensions and kinds of stuff that really, you know, make people, make life very difficult for people. Does anyone else have a question? Thank you, Steve. Okay, if there are no more questions. Uh, Again, you know, I'm starting to do in-person classes. You're all invited. I know a lot of people don't live in New York or Connecticut where I live, and, but people are coming. You know, we had class, we had two classes today of hands-on healing. And, and these are very powerful classes. And I've seen people get transformed in front of my eyes. Amazing, you know, what's taking place. So you're all welcome to find a way to come and you to come for three, four days. There's rather an inexpensive hotel that I'm gonna buy stock in because everybody is staying there. <laughs> That's not far from where I live.
Okay, if there are no more questions, then again, God bless you all. Thank you. And I have a deep humility and a deep sense of gratitude for the presence of everyone that attends these sessions. So bless you and thank you. And there will be a class tomorrow evening. And uh, I hopefully people will make it. I'm looking forward to it. So bless you and thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Good night.